In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the kurtosis of a distribution. As it's traditionally discussed, kurtosis refers to how peaked a distribution is. By the way, peaked can be pronounced peaked or peaked, but I and many other people prefer peaked or peakedness instead of peakedness and peaked. The traditional approach is not wrong, it's approximately right, but it fails at the extremes, and so I will discuss kurtosis more precisely than just saying it refers to the peakedness of a distribution. So a normal curve is said to have no kurtosis, and we compare other distributions to the normal curve to decide how peaked the distribution is. Here is a leptokurtic distribution. Lepto means thin. It refers to the thinness or skinniness of the middle compared to the normal curve. Now it has to make up for the thinness in the middle somehow, and it makes up for it at the tails. The tails actually are thicker than the normal curve, and thinner in the middle. A platykurtic distribution is thick in the middle, especially around the one standard deviation mark, and thin in the tails. That is, most of the scores are close to the mean, and there are very few extreme scores. So, here's the traditional way of talking about kurtosis. Leptokurtic, thin middle, thick tails, meaning that there are more extreme scores than in the normal curve. And platykurtic means thick middle, thin tails, not very many extreme scores compared to the normal curve. Again, this approach is not wrong, it's just that it's not precisely true in many cases. So here's a normal distribution and I've drawn five points in that normal distribution, just sort of at random, and I've shown these arrows which represent deviations from the mean, or distance from the mean. So this score here deviates from the mean. The mean happens to be zero in this case, and differs by about two or so. This one differs by about three, this one by about two and a half, this by uh, about two and a half, this distance is about two and a half, this distance is about two, and by distance, it doesn't really have a negative value. This distance I'm going to refer to as the extremity of the score. Some scores are not extreme, close to the middle, and some scores are more extreme, far from the middle. The fourth standardized moment, or the standardized fourth moment, is very closely related to kurtosis. In fact, if you just subtract 3 from this quantity, you'll get kurtosis. So this minus 3 equals kurtosis. I'm going to take this fourth standardized moment, and I'm going to split it up. So in the middle, we have what's called a standardized score, or a z-score. What it is, is that each score has the mean subtracted from it. And then this deviation here is divided by the standard deviation. So a score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation is a standardized score. If we take that standardized score and raise it to the fourth power, the average of that distribution will be the fourth standardized moment. Now this all by itself isn't very meaningful, but if we split this term into two parts, like so, its meaning becomes a little bit clearer. Here we have the same standardized score to the second power, and then the standardized score to the second power. If we multiply this, we'll get this again. But separate, it reveals something. In the tutorial about skewness, we had this term multiplied by this term to the first power. So this term to the first power represents its position on the number line. When we square the term, it represents the variability, or if we rename one of these, it represents the extremity of the position. Rather than where it is, it represents how far the distribution is, conceptually. When we multiply these two terms and take the expectation, what we're getting at is the relationship between the extremity of the score and the variability. And what I mean by that is that some scores are at a position that is extreme. This 6 is fairly extreme. This negative 6 is also fairly extreme. They're equally extreme scores because they're the same distance from 0. And we can measure how much variability is in this region and in this region compared to other positions. Here's a leptokurtic distribution, and what I'm saying is that as we get more extreme in the scores, we get more variability. That is, the more extreme 
these, this, this curve is higher than the normal curve is. And when they're less extreme, it's less variable. That is, there are fewer scores in this region here compared to the normal curve. With skewness, we were able to use normal mixture distributions to understand this point a little bit more clearly. Here's a normal mixture distribution. It consists of a lot of normal distributions stacked on top of each other. So when we take all these normal distributions in color here and stack them on top of each other, what we get is this black leptokurtic distribution. This big peak in the middle occurs because these middle distributions that are not extreme have less variability. This red curve is right in the middle and it's narrow. The orange curves are a little bit more extreme, but not much, and they're also wider. They have more variability. The yellow curves are a little bit more extreme and a little wider. The green curves are more extreme and wider, more variable. And the blue curves are the most extreme and the widest of all, the most variable. So these wide distributions at the extremes are causing these thick tails, and these less variable distributions in the middle are causing this thin peak here. So with a leptokurtic distribution, we're saying that as the extremity goes up, the distance from the mean, the variability at that position also goes up. Let's look at negative kurtosis. With negative kurtosis, we have precisely the opposite pattern. As the position becomes more extreme, the variability at that position goes down. So, in the middle positions that are not extreme, we get lots of variability. And at the extreme positions here, we get a lot less variability. Typically, this produces this pattern with a thick middle and a thin tail, but soon we'll see that's not always true. Again, we'll use a normal mixture distribution to understand this. So here in the middle, we have this red, very wide distribution. It's not extreme, and it's very variable. The orange distributions are a little bit more extreme and less variable. The yellow, more extreme, less variable. Green, even more extreme, and less variable, and the blue distributions are the most extreme and the least variable. Add these on top of each other and you get this kind of distribution here, which is thick in the middle and thin in the tails. Now if this pattern were a bit more exaggerated, we could make it even more platycurtic, and you might predict that this thing becomes ever flatter and flatter and thicker and thicker, but that's not what happens. This is where the traditional account of platycurtic distributions breaks down. As this pattern becomes more extreme, you don't get flatter and flatter, you actually start to get a little dip in the middle and two peaks here. And then as the position gets even more extreme, you get a big valley in the middle and two peaks on each side. That is, right around the one standard deviation mark on the right and the one standard deviation mark on the left, you'll get two peaks like this. This is a bimodal distribution, and this is a very platycurtic distribution. It's not fat in the middle, it's actually just the opposite. It's got nothing really in the middle. The distributions underneath it that are underlying here, it's this red distribution is right in the middle and it's very wide. And then the orange ones are a little bit more extreme and a little less wide. The yellow are more extreme, a little less wide. The green are more extreme, a little less wide. And then the blue ones are the most extreme and the least wide. So as the positions become more extreme, the variability at that position becomes narrower and narrower until you get these two peaks and the valley in the middle. Now, this is a very platycurtic distribution. It means that it has negative kurtosis. Positive kurtosis can go very, very high. It can go as high as you want it to go. But negative kurtosis has a lower limit. There's one distribution that is the least kurtotic possible. It has a kurtosis of negative two. Negative two is the lowest it goes. And there's only one distribution that goes that low. It's the binomial distribution that looks like this. You need two values. It doesn't really matter which values they are. It could be negative 1 and 1 like it is here. It could be 0 and 1. It could be 38 and 147. It doesn't really matter what two values they are. The distribution has to consist of two and only two values. And the distribution has to be 50-50. 50% of the values are here and 50% of the values are here. When this occurs, you get a kurtosis of negative 2. And this is as low as it goes. Any other distribution will have a higher kurtosis than this.
Now what we can see is this, this is an extreme manifestation of this pattern here that is becoming ever more bimodal and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and it gets to the point where there is no variability here and no variability here and there's nothing in the middle like this. There's nothing in the middle, no variability here, no variability here. And the only reason that this distribution has any variability at all is that you have two values. It turns out that this distribution does have a variance of 1. But once we account for the variability at the 1 standard deviation mark here and the negative 1 standard deviation mark here, there's no variability left over. And this is the least kurtotic distribution possible. Again, this is why the traditional approach to kurtosis doesn't make sense at the extremes. With very low kurtosis, you no longer have that thick middle thin tail thing. So in a way, negative kurtosis refers to the bimodality of the distribution. The traditional approach makes more sense when we're talking about leptokurtic distributions. So we've talked about the mean, we've talked about variance, we've talked about skewness, and we've talked about kurtosis. The formula for kurtosis is that we take the fourth central moment and we divide by the standard deviation to the fourth power, or in other words, we call it the fourth standardized moment and then we subtract three. Now this three isn't just arbitrary. It turns out that there is a concept closely related to moments that's called a cumulant. What the cumulant is exactly I'm not going to get into here because it's more complicated than it needs to be. If you're really interested in what a cumulant is, it's this formula right here, but your understanding of, of this doesn't depend on your understanding of cumulants. I just wanted to make it clear that these four statistics that are widely used by statisticians to describe distributions weren't chosen at random. It turns out that there are underlying similarities between the measures and that they are connected in an interesting way. This idea of the standardized cumulant is interesting because the first standardized cumulant represents the signal to noise ratio, that is, the mean, the raw first moment, divided by the standard deviation, which is often used in many applications. But for our purposes, we want the mean, the variance, the skewness, and kurtosis. The most important thing you could know about a distribution is where is the middle, and the mean is a great way of describing the middle. The next thing we would probably want to know is how variable it is, and the variance is great for that, also the standard deviation, the variance, the square root of the variance. The next thing that we might want to know is how lopsided the distribution, and skewness gives us a good idea of how lopsided the distribution is. And for a lot of purposes that's all we need, but sometimes we want to know how peaked a distribution is, or more precisely, what is the relationship between the position and the extremity of the score. And for that, we need kurtosis. What is there after kurtosis? Well, there are lots more cumulants and standardized cumulants and moments and standardized moments. But it turns out that those ideas have diminishing returns. For most purposes, we know quite a lot about a distribution when we know just these four things. We don't know everything, but we know a lot.